the quality of the team to being higher than the light. Just catching everybody up here. So there's this mime from Pasach Eliyahu who says like this. It brings out the sort of classic debate whether the tzimtzum is kapshuto or lav kapshuto, right? What does that mean? Basically, this notion that the Arizal says that Hashem made a makom panoi or a halal of space and emptiness, in, like in order to, to make the space of the worlds, there's like a, there's a classic debate sort of between Hasidim and the, the, the original misnagdim whether that space is supposed to be taken literally or not. In other words, does it mean there's actually a space where Hashem is not, right? Which is what the, the others said, that, that Hashem actually like removed himself from the space of the world, which basically gives the connotation to, to, to evil that it's a place where God is not found. And the Alter Rebbe basically came and said that this is a very, very dangerous misreading of, the, of what the Arizal meant. And he said that it doesn't mean that the God is removed from the place. It means that the light was removed. When it says it's empty and it's like a cavity, yes, I agree, it's an empty cavity, but empty, a cavity of what? Not of God, but of the, of the light. And now that we're on this topic, we can understand which light. The orange sort that's lamata mata, right? The light which is expressed and revealed and showing like infinity. Yes, they made that light, so to speak, was a cavity made in it and went away, right? And so it removed itself. And when it removed itself, what was in the place, not nothing, but on the contrary, like the Atmos was in that place, right? Because the, the, the Orient Tov is not, is not God, it's the ray of God, right? So when the ray goes back into the essence, it's not that there's now nothing there. On the contrary, there's something much, much higher there, right? The essence is there. That, the, the fact that you can't see light means that you are seeing the essence. Or in this capacity, what we're saying is you're seeing the koach habli gavul. If you want to say it in like a little bit lesser um, dramatic way, you're seeing the light that's lamay lamayla. Because the, the light that goes high, infinitely high and is going back into the essence, it shows up as an absence of light. So when you're seeing the absence of light, you're not seeing no God, you're seeing a, a, a revelation of God which is higher than the one you previously saw when there, when there was light. And this gives you a completely different understanding of right. evil and negativity. Because now, in the evil, actually is contained, not only it's that, that God is not in that place, which is already anyway ridiculous because every Jew believes that God fills all places and there is, there's no possible existence without uh, of, of light or darkness, of something or nothing without God being in that place. So it now comes to understand that in the place where you don't see God, what you're really seeing is a higher level of God. In the place which we've been describing in this past, in the place where you see Matthias, Yeshus, worldliness, even though it looks like this separate, finite thing which is incomparably low to God and even almost in up, 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 like a contradiction to him because it's saying that he exists it, I mean, it doesn't. The reality is in order to make that existence, it comes from the light which is Lamai Lamaila, pulling itself away back into the essence and therefore sort of leaving in its wake this experience of something besides God, which is actually a presentation of Hashem's essence, or at very least, it's a presentation of, of Hashem's light, which is Lamai Lamai Lamai. All right, but the idea that... You so followed, everyone follow this before we run on? Do you get that idea? Uh, Just, yes. The idea is like, what's the nature of darkness? And really what we're saying is what's the nature of evil? So according to the... The previous understanding of the Arizal, which is the literal understanding of the Arizal, which the Alter Rebbe says is very dangerous, right? That's what it means. Tzimtum Kapshuto means, are we to understand the Tzimtum literally? Which others, the, the Misnagdim were basically saying, it's not only the Misnagdim, it was like back, back to the time of the Arizal, there was already like a misunderstanding of what he meant. He says, yes, let's understand it literally. When Hashem creates this vacancy, it's vacant of God. And therefore, anything that basically comes from there is something where God is not in it. It's kind of weird when you learn Tanya and you understand that nothing can exist without the continuous enlivening of God. You have to sort of forget that for a second because you're you're already a chassid of the Alter Rebbe, so you like think that way. But before they thought that way, or basically before they understood the Arizal this way, they were thinking that anything which, which is from that space of darkness is like the devil. And it's basically like some kind of a power which is existing without God in it. He's like maybe observing it from above, but it has an existence like independent of him. It's crazy to think like this because it's like idolatrous. And that's why the altar Rebbe says like mud covers the eyes of people who came out with this. Like they're like too smart for their own good. They thought they were understanding the Arizal. It really contradicts like Jewish theology. 
I won't mention names, but these were like some of the greatest thinkers of the day, right? And so that's what one of the whole reasons of the second book of the Tanya is to come and like set the record straight and explaining it in an open of Chabad where it can be made sense to everybody. So much so that the point that the I just said hardly makes sense at all to anybody anymore. And he explained it the other way around. It seems it was not meant to be understood kipshuto, simply that there's actually an absence of cavity of godliness. So then what do we mean? We're not changing the word of the Arizal. He said that there was a vacancy and a void. And so the altar explains that's a void, not of God, but of the light that was shining out of God, which was we're describing in more detail as the, the, as the orange soap that's lamata mata, the light that comes out and basically negates all Matthias, right? And so when that light will be dis- will come back into his essence, it's called the Tzimtu, it will contract back into it, which we now know is also light, right? The removal of the light is not an absence of anything, it's a presentation of a light which is higher than the original light. That's what is responsible for the cavity. And so when you're seeing this cavity, it's not an absence of God, it's an absence of the light that's lamata mata, and it's actually the presentation of a light which is lamai lamaila, which means it's even higher. Which means we now reach, reach, re-understand our, our the notion of evil and darkness in a totally different Hasidic way, which is that darkness is filled with even a higher form of light, and that everything which is ne- negative and and feels more and more of itself is actually a deeper um, revelation of the light which is going infinitely high, which can't be understood and can't be perceived, and that's why it appears as evil, but it actually has the highest sparks. And it's actually the reason why the whole world was created was to get to those things because in those lowest things is held the highest sparks of God. It has the power of the Tzim Tzum, which is higher than the power of the light. Essentially, the essence is contained there. This is like the sort of principle that all of Hasidic thought is standing on, right? Which is why we're all of a sudden happy. It really, it changed the whole way we looked at it because like now everything's good. We just have to reveal that it's good. Before there was like a situation where not everything was good. And everything was pretty much bad. <laughs> and so we were just like in this constant fight of like, it was like, when will God take the bad away and like, like come back to us? Whereas now we understand that we just have to reveal behind the curtain, it's everything is good. And therefore, how do we reveal that? By actually being in a state of joy and recognizing and being like thankful for the, the, that truth. And when we, when we sort of have belief in, in the fact that, that it's good, it reveals the good. And therefore the whole Jewish attitude changes. If that's just like being happy, that's the way to bring the Shia. It didn't used to be like that. Judaism was a tough ride. Since Shver Tzadiyah, they used to say, it's, 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 it's hard to be a Jew. And the Rebbe basically stopped people from saying that. He said, stop saying that. There was like a phrase about all of our bubbies and everyone you knew. It's just, it's hard to be a Jew. That was like how, how we went. Not anymore. It's great to be a Jew. Okay, you wanted to say something? Yeah, right. Well, isn't the idea of the Tzimtzum revealing a deeper, a deeper aspect of God? Does it not only really apply to when we're talking about the iron, the iron stuff as it's absorbed into God's essence? Because when it's absorbed into God's essence, God's essence is revealed. That all makes sense, but the Tzimtzum itself isn't what's higher than the art. The effect that the Tzimtzum has on the iron brings out the essence. It's not the tzimtzum that's Hashem's essence. It's the light as it's absorbed into God's essence. That is the tzimtzum. That's what the tzimtzum is. Why don't you see light at that moment when you see darkness? Because you're seeing the light. You're seeing the light as it's absorbed into Hashem. The other way, the, even a deeper way of saying which is what the actual altar of actually says in that pasuk Eliyahu is that you're seeing the essence when you're seeing the darkness. You're, because you're because the light is absorbed and you're seeing that. You're seeing what's called light absorbed in the essence. It looks like this, right? It looks like Yeshus and Matthias. That that is atmos essentially. So okay, so fine. But then why would it when that happens, fine, that makes sense. But when that happens in this world, if Hashem's teva is to be teva mated, then when there's symptom, shouldn't there only be good? If Hashem's essence is good, and Hashem's deepest, deepest self is good, it is, is it, it is only good, but the problem with this type of good is that it's so good that it's incomprehensible. A man killing another man is it's so good. It's yes, yes, yes. Because according to what you're saying, and I believe you, because I'm also a believing Jew as yourself, God is only good. Ein ra yorid milamayla. As it says in the Chazal, the altar it brings in the 11th chapter of Yigir Sakot, it's a very famous one, Laskil Chabiri, which discusses this very point. You should check it out. And he says, there is only good, right? The only problem is there's good that can be seen and there's good that can't be seen, right? God only does good. He's not mean ever to anyone. 
It's just that sometimes you are in a situation where you might be doing mamash a very kind thing. Like maybe your mamas like taking like 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 some some like like I don't know. There's the famous story that uh, the Rebbe told Eli Wiesel when there's these guys like standing over the uh, like a body with like knives and masks on it. Looks like mamash like a horror scene. And all of a sudden you back up and you realize it says emergency room and they're saving the guy's life. Right? A little bit. It's all perspective. Like th- th- it could be a very very kind act that you're in the middle of saving your life. But because you don't have the perspective from outside, it looks like a, like some kind of a murder scene. The reality is Hashem is doing good. But if the good is so good, it defies our understanding right. because we're only simple human beings, right. right? And so therefore, we call that bad. So you say, it's murder. It's terrible. You say, yes, I agree with you. As, as far as you're seeing the reality and you're like little condensed understanding of what can be perceived in the bigger picture. I agree with you. No one's arguing that to your perspective, this is bad. I'm just telling you that it's not actually bad. It's just a type of good, which is beyond your comprehension. When your comprehension will expand to the place of God's, you'll see that that was actually good. It's just that it's not for us to see that right now. It's, it, this engenders the concept of Amuna and Betachan and all these types of things. And so the idea is that not only is it good, but why is it in, an incomprehensible good? Because it's it's godly good. It's good at the level that God can understand, which is way better than the good that you can understand. Right. So they actually, when everything's going nice and it's like flowers and 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 and, and you know spring walk with a nice tune on and like you're feeling good, this is because Hashem had to bring the real good so low and so like 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 small of a good that it's actually attainable and comprehensible by a finite creature like a worm, right? right? So. He's not allowed to actually have real good. I'm sorry, you can't understand it, but it is good. And not only is it good, but it's even a better good. And why, therefore, do you experience it as bad? Because it's such a better good. So when, I, when Hashem introduced this thing called the Eitz Adas Tevara, and from that there is this thing called Klippas Nega, where things can either enter the field of good or evil. It's a very da- I feel like it's a very dangerous thing to say. If you, if you do a sin, if you commit a vice which God considers evil, that's not evil. That's the ultimate good. No, no. You see, it is potentially the ultimate good. And and You're I'm not, I'm not denying that, that the reality is, it actually is the ultimate good. Even, even, I'll, tell I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because tshuva is a geshmak thing for Hashem. And that's why he allowed this whole scenario to happen. Now, that being said, it's not, we're still, we're still under orders here. The same God that we don't understand, we do understand that he visited us and gave us very clear instructions. So to go ahead and, and do something that he's asking you not to do, we're not allowed to do it, right? Whether the fact that we can describe that as good, why are we describing that as good? Because we understand God a little bit, and we understand that God said that this is good, and they're really, but he, he also, the same God that we're supposed meant to understand, told us not to do that. So that's not the way that we are allowed to access that good. We can only access that good in certain ways which is permissible to Torah. Now, if it should happen that you sin and you go against Hashem's will, and therefore you created a monster, it winds up that even then, it's only good because you can do tshuva. And tshuva is something which is so precious, it's also higher than a tzaddik, as you know. Why is it higher than a tzaddik? Because you take that incomprehensible low thing and you return it to good. It's not the avera that's good. The avera just creates more concealment. But the, but the reality is, is that you can undo the Avera, so to speak, with the proper amount of tshuva, and then turn even a greater a greater lowly thing, which, as right. you said, is a higher spark of God, that, is, right. that you can even reveal that. You know, it doesn't mean you have to look for Averas. The, the funny thing is that it says Mashiach will come and even make tzaddikim do tshuva, because Averas are very easy to find, and when you say Avera, it doesn't even mean an actual sin against the Torah. Sometimes an Avera is just your incorrect perception of your of, of that you exist. Right, so what does it mean that tzad- a Mashiach is going to get tzaddikim to do tshuva? They don't have to do tshuva; they don't have to get hara. What tshuva does a tzaddik have to do? Right, it's like a it's a question. And the idea is that the very that there there are different levels of bittul. The fact that you even think you exist, you already have to do tshuva for that, because you're already like in some kind of a tachton that need that is that is incorrect and wrong. You're, you're already like a product of the team too. Right, okay. and so therefore you can you can you can show that my my previous state of thinking that I existed was incorrect and and and, and reached tshuva. Right, according to your logic about hastari, of, of of God's light being about hastari, like, like tzimtzum. Yeah, tzimtzum of God's light being a revelation of God's essence. 
Although the idea of chuba does make complete sense, that the, the that, that you can re, you can see how Hashem's essence is being revealed through chuba and Navira, according to the logic that simsum is 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 an absorption and therefore revelation of God's essence, that logic would spill over to say that the avira itself would be a revelation of Hashem. That's so you, dangerous. It, 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 listen, I'm, I hate to tell you, but the 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 alternative is much more dangerous. Because if you say that the Avera is not Hashem, you've gone back into the thinking of the Misnagdim before Hasidis, which is that there's a place in, in some time of Metzias where Hashem is not there. And not only is it dangerous, it's idolatrous. It's much worse. I, I, there's a problem with both with both perspectives. Basically, the way like the 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 the, the, the alternate Hasidim sort of joke about it is that is that the Mestakim used to say, you know, God is not in the bathroom. Because there's a place which is so foul that has to to say that our God, like, has anything to do with that. If anything, he, like, sort of watches it from above. He's mashgiach, milamayla, but he's not in the evil because there's an empty space where God is not in that place, right? So God's not in the bathroom. That's how they, they sort of joke about it. Whereas we have to say God is in the bathroom. Sorry, right? Even in the place of Tuma and Misa, there's how can it be there and exist if God's not there? Neither of them are very nice things to say about God, right? But to say God is not in the bathroom is much worse, as it turns out, because you're basically putting a limitation on him and saying that there's a place in reality that he cannot reside in. What have we just been learning for the last five days right. is that the orange so is Lamata Mata Adein Tachlis to the point that he goes into Paro right. while Paro is denying the brach of Yaakov and saying, I made the river and I made myself. So I'm not saying that it's revealed godliness. I'm not saying that the Avera is revealed godliness. In a, in a way, in, in, when, it, when the Avera happens, it's it's Paro that's, that's happening. So Paro is also essence. God. You're saying it was Hashem's essence. It is. But when the, but you the, know what Paro stands, I'm sure you heard this, that Paro comes know. to, the, Paro is a very high thing. But the way that the Tanya explains it, isn't it that it's it's Hashem's life force as it goes through insane amounts of control? Yes. And that's Hashem's are, essence. No, because on the contrary, what are we, what are we learning about that it goes into insane amount of contractions on one hand right on the other hand it's everywhere that's only the light that's that's contracted that goes into these contractions that's only the or mamale right and that's what gets lower and lower and cut off and cut off to the point that it's like dead but we, we, we've been saying we're trying to explain that the orange so that's lamata mata it goes in that very same place is occupying that same place in every little inch of it, it's just not mit arev. It doesn't mix in. Remember, we had this long conversation. Mata, this. Mata, mata, mata. mata mata first. Even the even the mata mata. Right? So the orange soap is there in that place. First of all, it's just in a state of contraction. What's the contraction as element? It's also lamaila lamaila, and that's what gives it the ability to be para. Right? The fact that it's that, that it's simultaneously lamaila lamaila. That's basically what creates the mamale light. Right, the fact that the light sort of disappears gives all of a sudden the experience of the creation to be there, even though the orange soap is also there and the creation is actually nullified. The creation doesn't know it's nullified because right. simultaneously the orange soap that's lamai lamai is holding that place and making a paro out of it. Now, in that state, the the, the tzimtzum is there and it's higher than the, 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 the it's the highest thing at the table, but it's not revealed. And so that's the difference between let's say a mishkan of Hashem, a Moshe Rabbeinu, versus a paro. Is that, that the Moshe is, is 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 showing that his Matthias is Elokus, and therefore the, in the place of of, of, of Moshe is the Atzmus Mamish, in the place of the Mishkan is the Atzmus Mamish. Whereas in the place of Paro, the Atzmus is there, but it's not revealed, right? It's, it's it's there, but it's not revealed. So I'm saying it is the Atzmus, but it's not revealed, and therefore it's not that this is, Hashem does not have a dear batachtonim yet, and therefore even though it is God, it's not desirable for Hashem. It's not the end game. It's not what Hashem is. Is doing it for. He's doing it so that tshuva will happen. It will be revealed. But to say it's not the atzmos, to say that he's not in the bathroom, no, it's idolatrous. So who's in the bathroom? It's the devil. It was independent powers from Hashem. It's again, they're both difficult things to say. <laughs> the, yours, which seems like a, you're saving God's like covered, right? That's the show to say the aver is Hashem. My God would, but then what are you actually saying about God? You're you're, you're breaking the second commandment. <laughs> that there's something else besides God. If they're both troubling, yours is much more troubling. Not yours, Chastor Shalom, but you're the one that you're presenting at the moment. But the idea of Hashem being in Avera doesn't have to, you don't have to necessarily take it away. You could say Hashem's life force and Hashem's, Hashem's, Hashem's chayas 
is being Messiah that thing, but through a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of contractions. So to say that that's a gilly of his essence. Yeah. To say that, but, because the but again, what is the gilly of the essence? Something incomprehensible. And that, that could, something could go against Hashem or be bad. There's nothing more incomprehensible than that. Essence. There you go. Well, you want to see the essence? You don't want to see the essence, my friend, because you can't understand it and it's going to look crazy to you. Right? That's the definition of it because it's something which is incomprehensible. And then when it comes, you say, that can't be it. It's incomprehensible. No, that, that's it. It's incomprehensible. Now, again, it's not the end game. Hashem doesn't like let it just lie there in an incomprehensible state. He wants to be, He wants you to bring out the reality that's the essence. How do you do that? Torah and mitzvahs. Torah and mitzvahs takes that incomprehensible gashmius shtus and it converts it to being a revealed essence as opposed to concealed essence. So then why, why doesn't Natanya say that? Why does what? Natanya says it all over the place. And this is what this is what we're reading as a parish on Natanya. Well, on the, well, let's say like you had like a month ago on the Daily Tanya when Natanya said that the, the Sitra Achla and the Achla, they, 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 it's, it's, it's God. Like you can't say they're not God, but it's God as he presents his life force in an extremely dimmed way. It doesn't say that it's God's essence. Not in that particular chapter, but elsewhere it does. Because what else is it? It's obviously not God's revelation because God's revelation looks good, seemingly. So if it's not the revelation, you have two choices. It's the empty space, isn't which it, either means it's not God or it means it's the highest form of God. Isn't the revelation Ma'ayna Ma'ar? Ma'ayna Ma'ar. Right? So what it, oh, what it, the, the revelation, <laughs> there's two revelations now that we've got this on the table. One revelation is the Orient Surf, that's Lamata Mata. That's Ma'ayna Ma'ar in the sense that it nullifies all Matthias. Then there's another another revelation from the Hashem, which is me'ena ma'or in a different way, because it's not really light shining. So it is me'ena ma'or in the fact that it's incomprehensible. Hashem is incomprehensible, and he brings out something which is incomprehensible. So that's the me'ena ma'or part about it. That's what's essence-like about it, is that it's, it's incomprehensible. If it's me'ena ma'or, and you, and, then you're and you want it to be godly, then you're talking about actually the lower form of the, the orient sof, not the higher form. The part that comes out and shines and says, I'm God, which, which, is, which is not the Matthias and the Yeshus of the, of the creation. That's the part of the higher form of God's light, which comes out and looks like saying, it looks like it's saying, I'm not God. But that's actually the higher light. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad that we're, 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 we're spinning around this idea so much because it should be annoying because it's so counterintuitive to say that bad is good. And it's really what the, the everybody was worried about, right? It's what everybody was worried about. That's why there was a tremendous like opposition to this philosophy coming out for the very concerns that you bring to the table. They were afraid that Hasidim were gonna go off the derech and be, and stop being like from Yidin because they're like appreciating Averas in some weird way. And what happened was they stayed from, not only did they stay from, they stayed like mamish crazy chumradika from Jews. Like it, it did not steer us off the right path because it's actually more closely aligned with the true Achdus of Hashem. It actually creates for a, a healthier Jew if you if you understand it correctly. Remember, if someone uses this logic and says, I'm going to do an Averic because I'm going to touch Hashem's essence, that's, that's probably going to piss up Hashem very, very strongly, right? You know what it says? You know, you know, when, when yeah, in the, know. You're in the Torah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? It says that if you do not there. No, it says in the Torah that Nasa Adam Betzalmenu. Let's make men in our image. Moshe turns to God and said, let's make men. Who's we? And people are going to think that there's a Vodazara, that there's more than one Rashus. And Hashem said, write it, and whoever wants to make a mistake, let them make a mistake. Meaning to say, I'm not going to change the Torah because some guy who's out there is going to misinterpret it and take it the wrong way. And the Rebbe has like a diuk on that. He says, whoever wants to make a mistake will make a mistake. Meaning to say, it's not just a, a casual mistake. You're reading the Torah and it's the, 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 it's the, it's the description of the one God for all time. Like this is it, the Torah. And you're going to take, find one word in there and it says, let's, and you're going to decide that, the whole Torah, that there's many gods. You're not just making a mistake. You're a wanton, intentional sinner looking for something wrong because you could never take Avodah Zara as like the, 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 the storyline of the Torah. So you, you're not just making a mistake. You, that's what it says. Write it and whoever wants to make a mistake will make a mistake. A guy is going to come along and say, oh, I can do Averis now because Hasidus, he is not just a regular, like, innocent person. 
He's, he didn't read the whole book, which tells about all the mitzvahs and the, and, the, and the years of Hashem and fear of God and belief of God. So you you are looking for like a way to to sin and you're going to blame it on Hasidus. Hashem says, you know what? For that guy, write it. Whoever wants to mis- make a mistake and he's looking to, he's looking to blame me for his affairs, let him do it. So I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, we're not going to stop teaching this truth because of the wanton sinner who's going to take these ideas and run in the wrong direction with them. We, Baruch Hashem, are, we're, we're blessed to be considered responsible enough in these later generations to have the secrets of the Torah revealed to us. We must be able to handle them. And I don't know anybody. I know a lot of people who went off the derech. I don't know anyone who went off the derech thinking that, has, that because what they saw in Hasidus, therefore they should do a virus. I never, I never met anyone like that in all my years. Right. They go off the derech because they just stopped learning Hasidus, not because they keep learning Hasidus. According to this logic, Rabbi, why would Hashem be so mad and and go sorry for thinking one time. This no, you're not. <laughs> why? Why would I? Let's say if Hashem if 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 Hashem knew that we would do averus, but he's like, oh yeah, even if you do an avera, the truth is my essence is even more present here. And why would he go and slaughter millions and millions and millions of years? And in the navi, I'm saying it's because you went against my Torah. It's because you did evil in my eyes. Why would he then go and like put a, the yid through extreme pain, women being like super defiled? Children being slaughtered, blood going through the streets of Yerushalayim. Throughout generations, it's happening over and over again. Hashem really, really appreciated. It was, it was almost like with the Jews doing evil is like an art, an art of God's essence coming to the world. We're like, oh yeah, then all of you are going to die. I mean, you, you're basically saying the same thing over and over again, but I will, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you another answer from the famed answer of Manus Friedman, who, who gave... Uh, this little vort, right? Can he said the question that I asked. Yeah, he said that basically, Adam and Chava are in the garden, right? It's kind of a famous thing. I, apparently, he brought it up from a minor, but it's like really, I never heard, I never, I never saw yet the minor. But, and they didn't have a Yetzirah, right? They were born without a Yetzirah. They were like the greatest of all tzaddikim ever, and this, and and the, and the Yetzirah that even would be available in the world for later people was was. Was I was isolated from the snake, right? The snake had the full totality of evil in it, and they didn't have any evil in themselves. So the question becomes: How did they sin? How did they do a sin? It's, it doesn't even make sense that, that they could do something against Hashem's will. There was no agent telling them to do something wrong, not even in the slightest, slightest way. It was outside of that. So it turns out he explains they had a little conversation, right? And 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 basically they were like, Hashem told us not to eat this thing. What do you think we should do? And Adam was like, what do you mean, what do you think we should do? We should not eat it, right? What, what, what kind of a question is this? And she, with her bina yasera, right? women are considered to be smarter than men. She said, well, why would Hashem put it, this in the garden and tell us not to eat it? And then simultaneously tell us he wants, a, that the purpose of all creation is a dear batach toni, right? So he says, she, he says we're, she said, we're not in the batach toni because apparently if we eat this thing, we're going to be kicked out of the garden of Eden. And then that will be the tachtoni. Then we can really bring joy to Hashem, right? And so she ate the, 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 the forbidden fruit intentionally in order to do the will of Hashem. And again, at this point, there was no Yetzirah. So to say that she did something wrong is very hard to justify because there was no force in her to have the potentiality to go against Hashem. It was just like Rav and Abaya. They were sitting there discussing like a, like a Talmudic situation. What's the stock on this? We eat it or we don't eat it. He was saying we should stay in Gan Eden, right? Which is basically like the Pesach of like the Rambam, that the ultimate good is Gan Eden. She was saying we should hold like the Ramban. The ultimate good is Tchis Amesim and being in physical bodies and going to the lower place. And so the idea is that why, why is it this situation that we continuously have this, the original sin, right? What, it says that why did, why did it happen? What was the source of the original sin? It says actually... Hashem actually literally did it. Where? <laughs> in the world of Tohu. There's a whole mimer that Rebbe explains how the sin from below was a product of Hashem's original intention of, of making the world of Tohu and breaking it. And he says, where did that even come from? Why did, why did Hashem make a world and then destroy it? Why did Hashem make a situation where he made vessels which were too small or, or un, un, incapable of, of containing this light and then smash them. Is someone forcing your hand? Why did you do that? Why did you basically create a, a destroyed world? And then the, the Rebbe follows and he says, where did that come from? Where did the world of, where did the mishap, who sinned over there? How we can say, okay, she didn't have a Yetzirah. Hashem? 
<laughs> I don't think he has a yet to hurry either. Why did he destroy the world, right? Before it even got it created. And he said, the Rebbe says, let's trace it back. How did the, how did the, the world of Tohu break in the first place? Where did this like dissenting opinion come from the Chatzchila? He said, it seems so. It turns out Hashem actually has two opinions. Hashem has this infinite revelation of light. And then he's like, well, actually, no. Let's conceal all the light and make a complete concealment of the light. That's his own thing. Right. And the, and the point is, why don't we just leave it in God aided? It's not to Hashem's ultimate desire. He wants there to be this opposing opinion, which ultimately comes into the world of Tohu, which ultimately comes into the original sin, which ultimately comes out to basically, yes, every sin of every Jew is some kind of a, of a revelation in some way. Not that we're intended to do it, because it's like, so to speak, happens in a way which is which is not, you know, again, we're not Adam and Chava. We have a Yetzirah, we have a Yetzirah Tohu, we're told, Ubechar to Bechayim. So we we have we're supposed to fix this situation, but ultimately every descent is for the sake of an ascent. So you talk about murdering of, and and the, the pain that Hashem puts us through and all these things. If you're gonna like amplify the conversation into an emotional one, you're gonna win because it's not like we can explain pain, right? All we're saying is that in some higher dimension, and that's the whole point. It's inexplicable because it's dealing with an aspect of Hashem which we can't understand. It's the it's the hidden part of Hashem. But it doesn't mean it's not Hashem. It doesn't mean it's it's not the correct path. Hashem wanted the, the world to go into Gullis. He did not want Adam and Chava to remain in Gan Eden. It's brought out with proofs, right? Yeah. Because it says that before the, the world was even created, the Torah was created. In the Torah, it says, Adam ki yabus bo'el, a man who will die in a tent. This is the laws of Tuma. Well, if there was no Gullis from Gan Eden, there would be no death in the world, and therefore the Torah could not be fulfilled. Similar to what we're learning in, in our Sikha, right? That the, like the symbol of Mashiach's coming is that there's going to be three more cities of refuge. That there's going to be more, more accidental killing, right? Mashiach could not come unless there was death in the world. Because Hashem wanted to kick them out of God Eden and create death, right? And that, that was, a, that was a, a step further to his dear Batachtonim, not a step away from him. He planned on it like that, just like he planned to destroy, destroy the, the, the vessels of Atzilus, of, of uh, Tohu, just like he planned to remove all the light. It's perplexing and confusing, but we have to say that it's Hashem, and we have to say it's a higher dimension of Hashem, because it's incomprehensible. That's what lays out the, that's what it is. And Hashem's deepest desire is for these two opposing revelations of himself to be united. That's the ultimate thing, right? Uh, it's only, you only like sort of like get to the real essence when it's revealed when the two things come together, and that's Torah mitzvahs. It's yeshis, but with the simultaneous revelation that the yeshis is God, right? It's really the fusion of man and woman. Like woman comes from the atzimus, man comes from the gilu, but they're supposed to get married, which means he then reveals to her that she comes from the atzimus, and she. So so he's like sort of giving her her purpose in life. He's revealing that, that, that her hidden self, because she's like the earth, he's like the heaven, right? He reveals to her, you need the heaven to reveal to the earth that the earth is higher than the heaven. The earth would never figure it out on itself. So there's like this interview, and, and she gives him his life's purpose, because she's there to be to, to, to be the object of, 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 of revelation, right? This is the whole point of marriage. That's why marriage is called Kedusha, Kedushin. It's like, it's like the symbol of... What is this mime called? Basi Lagani Laganuni. I've come to my chupa, right? It's the whole idea of, of basically the point is, is that when these two things marry themselves, the Gilui and the Tzimtzum, when they marry themselves, that is the, the revelation of the essence. Until then, it's like sad. This woman's over there, this man's over there. They're both lonely, right? All right. Should we start the mime today? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so inside for the last five minutes of class, we'll do a line or two. Oh, you, you're, you're serious. Yeah, we have five we minutes. We haven't started the line. We haven't started. That was the best class of the year. Wow. <laughs> well, wow. Some people got up and left, but uh, for those who stayed, maybe. Anyway, so what are we saying here? Let's take it from inside. You guys have the mimer in front of you? Yes. All right, every, every five, you know, the, 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 we're talking about the, the, the Chafetz Chaim. He was, a, he was a conversation piece not long ago in the yeshiva. It says, what made him so great? He asked, they asked him, how did you become so great? He said, five minutes. I got great in five minutes. They're like, what do you, come on. Like, I'm serious. I'm asking you a serious question. How did you get so great? It's five minutes. So the same five minutes that everybody else wasted. Oh, we only have five minutes of class. Let's go have a coffee and waste our time. He said, I used those five minutes. <laughs> that five minutes made him great. 
Okay, so let's use our minutes, let's right. use our five minutes. What's that? We just use the five minutes in the story with that. Listen, the story itself is a, is a Torah. So let's go inside. So he says, let's take it from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen lines down. It starts with the word Haya. You see that? No one's looking. Fine. Al yideat simtum. Right. If you go three words in, it says Al yideat simtum. He nis alama orin sof. Right. The orange sof disappears. Umasha nirgash peshitus. And therefore, what's left being felt as like the 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 natural scenario when the orange sof disappears is pechinas yeshus matzias. Suddenly, the the orange sof goes away. The nat- there's a suddenly there's a, there's a there's like an awakening of a natural feeling of self and independence. Orin so far enunyugash, and suddenly the infinite light is not felt. So, like the the experience where, where you don't experience yourself, whatever experience you would be having is just elukus and God goes away, and now now and now you experience yourself. Now, even though Hashem fills the heavens and earth, and it's, he didn't he didn't actually leave the place, but seems to hurak legabenu, and it seems to was only happening as far as we're concerned. So the reality is, is it's still only God, right? So, he, but he just like enacted this mechanism called the Orin Sof Shalomai Lamaila, which is a higher move on his part in the same exact place where the infinite light is shining. He's like, watch this. And he leaves the infinite light there and he turns on the super infinite light, which now removes the light seemingly from us as far as our experience is concerned. Avalagabi is barit, but as far as he's concerned, her it seems to a no master cloud. It seems to did not remove anything, right? Because it's actually just light. It's not something that it's not... Again, we're d- defining the seems new now. It's not a removal of light. If it was, then it w- he wouldn't be still there when he takes it away. He's still there, but he turns on like the superpower light, which makes it seemingly go up into its source and look to us like it disappears, but it does not conceal him from the place. And it still shines after the tzimtzum exactly as it did before. So we are right now drowning in an infinite light, which does not leave room for any separate existence whatsoever. And it's all around us and it's experiencing itself. And the only ones not experiencing it are us. A little lonely in this place. Again, we want to marry that to our experience. If we just left it to that experience, there'd be no us literally. If that experience was not happening, it would just be us. Neither of those two things are good places. We want to be here. And we're going to open up the channel to allow the true infinite light to be experienced while we're simultaneously in our place. That's called the marriage of these two different opposites. And that's called the Mishkan, right? Parsha's true, we're about to read. The Kamaimer, and this is what this perplexing statement that every Jew reads every morning, and none of us really understand it until now. This is the statement which says, Atahu kodav olam olam. We say this every day. And trust me, it's complicated. We say you are he who was there before he created the world, and you are he who, who was there after he created the world in exactly the same way. Which means most people would think that there was Hashem, and then he created the world, which means that there's something happened. Something happened. There was something new. There was the creation. So Hashem is slightly different before he created the world and after he created the world, because before he created the world, there was no world. And now he creates the world, there is a world. It's not the same. But we're saying is that that's that's you're missing on you're missing the point here. Hashem is exactly the same without any change whatsoever before he created the world, after he created the world. Because this that there's a world suddenly being seen. It's not some new addition. It's actually just Hashem is exactly in the same place. He's just revealing to our own selves that there's a world in place here, but not to him. He is not changed. Nothing happened as far as he's concerned. He only just revealed the light of his essence, which gave the experience of Matthias and Yeshus to us, but he did not change at all. The Einat Tzimtzum Mastir Klal. The Tzimtzum does not conceal anything from him, makes no um, change of the previous state of, of affairs when all there was was Elokus and the experience of nothing else. That's still happening, apparently. All right, and we'll get to the muscle of this tomorrow, Bizarat Hashem. Yes.